So our final keynote speaker is Phil Renforth from Cardiff University and he's going to tell us all about enhanced weathering as a negative oh, emissions you. option. Thank you, Phil. Lovely, thanks. Uh, how's the sound? Good. Um, okay, um, just because I'm the, the last keynote speaker, um, I thought I'd just take this opportunity to thank the organizers, Anders and the team here at uh, Chalmers for, for hosting uh, this event and uh, for inviting me to come and speak. Um, for about 10 years, I've, I've sort of had the novelty slot of a lot of uh, Earth science conferences, uh, sort of. Uh, so it's really quite nice to be the, the main course rather than an hors d'oeuvre. Uh, so um, my talk uh, over the next 20 minutes or so is going to be on enhanced weathering. Um, what I really want to do with the, the talk is talk about three, um, well, myths. <laughs> um, f the first is about, uh, these, are, these are things that crop up uh, quite often uh, when people talk about enhanced weathering. Um, the first is about the scale being large or un unprecedented and that upscaling will be an issue. Um, the, the second is that kinetics will be slow because this is a geological process, right? And then the, the last one is that this is somehow super expensive. Um, and within all of those three points, there's a lot of truth. So I'm not really going to take the antithesis of, of those, but try and um, explain some of the nuance behind um, enhanced weathering. And particularly, uh, describe, um, try and explain why we get such large um, uncertainties within some of these assessments. So that's what I'm going to try and do over the next 20 minutes. Another way of putting that, um, is that this is uh, uh, one of the statements from the, the 2009 report on geoengineering by the Royal Society. And they describe enhanced weathering. Well, they don't describe it um, in so many words, but they, they use this sentence, which is the primary barriers to deployment are related to scale, cost, and possible environmental consequences. Now, if I was so bold to rewrite um, that, I might say it's something more like that. I, I should say that you know I'm, I'm guilty as anyone of, of sort of saying the, the first sentence um, there. But if I was to rewrite it now, maybe I would put more nuance in, um, and it might look something like this, that the barriers are related to the social, political, and environmental consequences and our ability to monitor and verify carbon. And I wouldn't uh, completely remove that the the cost and scale implications of this, but only that they're not necessarily exceptional and that these things are um, limiting for all negative emission technologies. Okay, right, so if you haven't heard of enhanced weathering before, I'll just spend a few slides talking about that. Um, it, the, the idea sort of originated from looking at the natural carbon cycle and weathering associated with, um, uh, integrated within that rock cycle. So. We can see that um, weathering, chemical weathering of rocks on the land surface pulls CO2 out of the atmosphere and transports it to the ocean, um, which then uh, forms sediment. And we know that when temperatures increase, rates of weather increase, so rates of drawdown increase, which decreases temperature, which reduces weathering. So this is sort of negative feedback on the, on the Earth's climate. But we know that that happens on the order of 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 years. So the real challenge within this field is how do we accelerate that on uh, timescales that are relevant to us. Um, so what reactions are we talking about? And this is the only slide I've got with chemical reactions, so don't worry, it'll be over soon. Um, the, um, the, the idea here is that we take a, a silicate mineral, we react it with CO2, um, and we produce a bicarbonate solution. Um, and then the... Um, the second step within that is that that bicarbonate solution um, precipitates out as a carbonate mineral. Um, this is an example silicate mineral, which is um, uh, well last night, but we can use a whole range of different silicate minerals, um, either artificial materials, and we're working in, in, in Cardiff looking at iron and steel waste, but there's a bunch of others, um, mine wastes, for instance. And then there's a bunch of natural materials, uh, natural minerals that we might um, exploit for these reactions. Um, in terms of where the carbon is stored, well, we might want to form a solid carbonate mineral, um, as in the second reaction here, or we might want to leave it as bicarbonate. 
in which case we need to store the carbon in the oceans or the bicarbonate in the oceans. Um, otherwise, you end up reversing um, the, 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 the storage. The, the reason why you might want to do this over this um, is that you get a two for one in terms of mineral um, to carbon. Um, and there's a whole bunch of arrows, right? So there's a, w a huge range of different ideas about facilitating these reactions. So, um, oh, and the other point is that if you do bicarbonate in the oceans, you can use carbonate as your um, reaction mineral as well. So that's quite interesting. Okay, so what are these arrows then? Um, this is a cartoon I made, um, which tries to describe some of these arrows. And you maybe um, thought I would just spend the presentation talking about adding minerals to the land surface, but there's a whole range of different ideas that have been proposed. Um, some that include adding uh, minerals to coastal environments or to directly to the ocean, uh, reacting rocks in, in reactors, um, doing some sort of electrochemical weathering, or doing lime production. Um, and I actually made this diagram just looking at um, technologies that do ocean alkalinity, but you might uh, have heard some about mineral carbonation as well, which maybe should have been on that diagram. And that is the idea of, first of all, ex situ is where you take your rock and you put it in a, a reactor and uh, capture your carbon in, in the reactor. Um, there's in situ mineral carbonation, which is what the CarbFix project does in Iceland, where you inject your CO2 and water into the rock, and the reactions happen underground. Um, now, notionally, these require higher purity CO2 to work, so they could, in theory, form the back end of a BEX or a DAC system. So there's some inter interesting integration issues that we might sort of want to explore. Um, this is always going to be more expensive than just injecting underground. Um, there's no way around that, really. It's just going to be more expensive than injection into saline aquifers. But what's really interesting about this is that you might not necessarily need pure CO2. So you think about Jen's talk uh, um, this morning, and she was uh, talking about the relative energy savings that you might get from just going to 5% or 10% CO2. Then we might want to use some of these reactions on, uh, on that and um, do it on a lower cost uh, uh, direct air capture system, for instance. Anyway. Um, I say I haven't really got time to go through all of these um, individually. Um, luckily, reinforcements are arriving at 11 o'clock in our weathering session um, downstairs. So we have uh, uh, David's going to speak about putting minerals onto the land surface, um, and Philip's going to speak about doing the, um, putting minerals onto the coast, um, and Greg um, is going to speak about electrochemical weathering. So if you're interested to know more about these individual ideas, then um, come along to our session. Um, and uh, Sarah, who's working uh, with us in Cardiff, uh, she's going to be talking about um, the environmental impact of increasing ocean alkalinity. So, and if you could travel back in time, you could have come to our session uh, yesterday, where we were talking about artificial silicate weathering and olivine weathering as well. So. Um, so do come along. But um, what I want to do is just talk about um, some of the things that um, uh, are common with all of these ideas. And the first one is scale limitations. Um, so the first place I start with uh, thinking about scale is the Earth system. Um, now, you might not be able to see that so well at the back, but this is the carbon cycle with all of the arrows removed. It's um, it's a bit of a sort of simplified version of Pete's um, uh, diagram that he put up. Um, and this is what we've put into the, um, the Earth system from f uh, historic emissions and um, land use change. And this is what the RCP scenarios are, um, look like on that diagram. Um, intuitively, that's quite a nice way of putting it, I think. Um, it sort of kind of shows us what the magnitude of the problem is. But I, I just wanted to put up what the potential of silicate mineral um, uh, uh, carbon sequestration is on that diagram, and it's the area of this uh, circle. So imagine this circle sort of extending around through the, uh, um, off the screen there. So, I mean, it's almost sort of, um, uh, it, 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 I mean, it's almost unlimited in, in that sense. Um, 
So the, the point really is um, it's, it's going to be a um, resource optimization issue and it's not going to be an issue about have we got enough material. There's a huge amount of resource in, in this. Um, not all silicates or, um, or rocks are the, uh, are the same and some rocks are better than others um, at capturing CO2. Um, the highest mass ratio we can get is with ultra basic rocks and they do 0.8 to, 0 .1, uh, to 1 ton of CO2 per ton of rock. Um, and that's sort of in that area of the diagram. And it says rocks that are rich in olivine. Um, but you can also do, uh, there's also um, potential in basic rocks, like your basalts. Um, and then also limestone as well, if you remember the, the slide a few slides ago. So, um, but that's assuming that we, we capture this, the, the, bico um, the carbon and store it as bicarbonate in the oceans. So for one gigaton of CO2, we need something on the order of one to five gigatons of rock. Now, if we're precipitating carbonate, that's where our carbon is stored, we, I mean, as a rule of thumb, you just double the, the number. So um, when we think about that in terms of, well, well is, that a, is that a scale that we can operate on? Well, um, oh, actually, okay, actually, before I go, this is a... Um, uh, uh, something um, uh, Jens Hartmann and Tobin and uh, Mans uh, sent me, and this is the range of, kind of says the same thing, but actually you can tailor your, um, uh, your technology to exploit the, the best rocks um, uh, for whatever process you, you go for. Uh, in some ways, I think the, the median value is a little bit meaningless on these scales because um, in some ways, you, you can target rocks that are um, uh, that are, are, the, are best for this process, and you might, might not necessarily be subjected to um, uh, con conforming to the mean of these things, but you might be able to select something right on the end of this this scale. Um, okay, so what what do we do in terms of um, enhanced weathering already? Well, naturally, uh, weathering consumes about one gigaton of CO2 per year. That's carbonate and silicate weathering together. Um, extraction, Jen mentioned this in her talk, um, and I, I think David makes a really good, um, uh, good argument in his paper on, on scale and, and extraction. But we, we, we extract about 50 gigatons worth of rock um, every year for aggregate. Um, and something on the order of 10% to sort of 15, 20% is waste or fine material. So material that um, uh, extraction companies can't sell. So, um, so there, there might be uh, scope with just using waste material from what's already been um, being extracted. In terms of what we already put on the land surface, well, we put something on the order of hundreds of millions of tons of calcium carbonate on the land surface. It's called agricultural lime. It's not really lime, but a calcium carbonate. So we already add uh, hundreds of millions of tons to the land. Um, in terms of lime or, um, or calcination, we do something on the order of four and a half gigatons of, of cement every year. Um, in terms of adding stuff to the, the, the coastal environment, well, um, uh, sand nourishment um, in the US and in, in the EU we, it is about sort of 100 million tons. It's probably a lot more when we start looking at um, other countries. Um, and global shipping is about 10 gigatons per year, um, although we don't add anything to the oceans, that's prohibited. Um, but we do add stuff to uh, coastal environments, so um, the Shellfish industry routinely adds sodium hydroxide to their, their stocks as a way of managing pests. So, and, I mean, it's, it's on a very small um, amount. The, the, the point I'm really trying to make with this slide is um, I, I find it hard to believe that we can't do about a gigaton, or one to 10 gigatons per year by the end of this century. You think about all of the, especially the, the extraction estimates, that's going to grow over the next 80 to 100 years as we feed the aggregate demand of um, 11 billion uh, people. 
So that's going to grow anyway, and I, can't believe, I, I just can't imagine that we, we, we can't fit something on the order of a, a one to 10 gigatons worth of extra capacity to do in, um, some of these technologies within that growing industry. So um, it's scale-wise, I, I don't see that as so much of a, an issue. I mean, there are, there's obviously going to be limits within this, and you know, you'd, I mean, if I said 100 gigatons were going to do, do enhanced weathering, then it, that sounds a bit preposterous, but something on the order of 1 to 10 seems pretty plausible. And in the context of um, Almut's talk and um, Pete's talk, that seems pretty relevant compared to other negative emission technologies. So why we're singling out enhanced weathering as a, some sort of issue with scale seems um, a little bit odd to me. Anyway, um, and I'd just like to put this up. This is um, if you're adding minerals to the land surface, can, how much can we add per, um, per area of land? And this is um, a nice paper that's come out looking at a, a combining a weathering model and a vegetation model and an earth system model. Um, and if you take what is quite a plausible addition rate, something not too um, dissimilar from what we already do in terms of adding lime, and you add it to a, a quite a large land area, but again, it's, I don't think it's, it's completely um, preposterous. We get, still get quite an enormous drawdown of CO2. So, sorry for just talking about what, I'm gonna talk a bit more about this in a second, but um, just uh, thinking about the, the potential of enhanced weathering on the, on the land surface, um, we could um, uh, potentially draw down quite a lot of uh, CO2 with sort of reasonable um, addition scenarios. Okay, so um, I've talked about scale limitations. What about kinetics? So that's something that crops up all the time. What are the rate limitations? Because we know that weathering is a, ge uh, a geological process, right? So um, I created this graph, and it's sort of quite hard to get your head around, um, but I'll try and explain, um, take you through it. If you plot a, a notional log uh, weathering rate, so this is how quickly a mineral dissolves on the x-axis, um, and how long it will take for that mineral to um, reach 90% of the reaction completion on the y-axis. And the color coding here is how much crushing you need to do. So how much, uh, what, what's the sort of mean particle size that you need to um, crush down to? Um, and the point really is that we walk kind of a knife edge of, um, of feasibility here. So um, the model sort of breaks down after a micron because uh, um, uh, the, the rate um, surface uh, area rate normalized uh, changes, um, the rate constant changes, sorry. So, but anyway, you can see that if we, if we were, let's say we were at this weathering rate here, actually I can probably put this up, here we are. So mineral carbonation, which was the sort of first thing that was proposed, this is the, the rate you might expect from olivine weathering between three and seven. And we know we need to get our reactions to work within an hour to get the, um, the, the capital cost of the reactor down. So they need to operate re relatively quite quickly. So it's sort of operating within this, this um, area here. If we go to ambient conditions, 25 degrees C, we might lose several orders of magnitude in rate, but we might be afforded several orders of magnitude in terms of t um, residence time within our yeah, great, uh, reactor. So we're sort of trading off these, 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 um, uh, these differences. So I'm kind of operating on a, on a log, log, log scale here. So, um, and I should say, actually, uh, so these are, there's only a few data points looking at mineral addition and what the rate you might expect from that. But the, the point I'm really trying to make is that the potential variability within this, whether we're talking about a single particle, which is like this, or a particle size distribution matters, and where we cut off the, um, the particle size distribution, whether it's um, 100 nanometers, one nanometer, or if we're adding minerals to the land surface, we might want to cut off at something like 10 um, micrometers to, um, uh, to stop any sort of harmful impacts with um, dust. Um, but the, the other point is that um, this, this diagram might be pessimistic in that we get additional uh, rate increases from biological activity, and this is a geometric surface area um, diagram. Um, 
So that might um, improve the, the, the prediction from the, the diagram, but it might also be over-optimistic in that some of the complex environmental geochemistry that we can get in these environments might slow down the reaction rate, and we might get differential dissolution within the mineral. The point I'm trying to make is that the order of um, the uncertainty across this space is orders of magnitude. So I'm working on a, a log, log, log scale with orders of magnitude uncertainty. So um, that's sort of that, that's the main reason why we have this uh, large um, uncertainty within the cost of enhanced weathering is because of this um, uncertainty. Right. Um, just very quickly talk about uh, um, specifically looking at uh, right here. Um, this is, I've, uh, we've done some very um, cursory. Um, Co uh, carbon and energy um, and cost calculations looking at terrestrial enhanced weathering. So I was just going to share with you some of the, the work we did on that. Um, right. Um, and this is sort of the, 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 the process. We extract the mineral, we grind it, we transport it, and then spread it. Um, and just for you know, saving time, we can say that actually these are pretty low energy um, uh, activities. And the, he, originally, I thought transportation was going to be an issue, but it seems like uh, some of the work we've done, um, well, Nils Nil Mustov done, and uh, what's come out uh, recently from uh, Jess uh, Streffler, seems like that the transportation isn't as much of an issue as we originally thought. Um, what is seems to be a consistent problem is the grinding energy. And that's pretty well resolved in a lot of models, um, as you could imagine. Um, but if you plot that on, the, on that log diagram, you can see that you've got a pretty broad range of, um, of, of potential grinding energy costs. Um, and we can do that. We can grind down to something on the order of 10 micro, um, micron sized particles, even down to one, at sort of relatively low amounts of energy. But it's when we start to get even lower than that um, do we start uh, um, increasing our energy requirements by sort of orders of magnitude. Okay, and this is just the, the sort of summary of that, the, uh, the energy costs and the, the um, financial costs, and that's sort of where, where we're at at the moment in terms of assessment. And there's sort of work that's going on and um, we'll continue to go on looking at trying to do more of a, a, a larger techno-economic assessment. So, um, and it's also worth saying that these are all uh, net removal using um, uh, UK grid, av uh, grid average um, CO2 emissions. I mean, if you decarbonize the power, things change enormously. So um, anyway, I, what I should just finish by saying is that I, I totally agree with some of the, um, the findings that uh, Jan Minx uh, presented in the what research needs to be done in enhanced weathering. And it's particularly these field experiments that we need a lot more of to try and resolve that uncertainty. Um, only I would add, we should do a lot more on comminution as well and, and particle size reduction. So I think this is a really exciting field, not um, uh, just because it's, it's worth sort of um, removing um, uncertainty within it, but there's a whole, you know, there's a really diverse technology um, portfolio. It's, uh, you know, as diverse as anything else within negative emissions. And I think we can, we can do a lot within um, this space. Not everything will work and some things will have niche applications, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that something within that space will be able to work at scale. So I'll just leave it at that, and thanks for your attention.